And it's my pleasure to introduce Jan Olivier. He is a research scientist at Meta in Paris. His background is on in mathematics and probability theory, differential geometry, group theory, and so on. And then he moved to work to work on machine learning. And nowadays he's mostly working on reinforcement learning. And I peeked at his slides, and I think that's gonna be quite exciting. And with that, yeah. The stage is yours. Okay, and thank you for the opportunity to to, to present here in this uh, global seminar. Uh, so I'm going to present work with Ahmed Twati and Jeremy Rapin, uh, who are uh, collaborators at, at MIDA. And the work is uh, moving from reinforcement learning agents to controllable agents. So what's a controllable agent? It's a reinforcement learning agent for which you can change the reward function in real time. So the motivation is you have an environment in which you can perform actions, but you don't have a reward signal at first. And your mission is to build a mental map of that environment. And the goal of that mental map is that if later on I describe to you a reward function, you immediately know how to optimize the reward function without any more computation or very simple computations. No learning, no gradient descent, no nothing. Um, and so the overall objective is to build fully controllable agents that are able to follow arbitrary instructions in a given environment. So for instance, you would have to have a robot that has a, that has a mental map of the, of the room and you can tell the robot to uh, optimize like its position or avoid certain positions or maximize like its Z coordinate or whatever, um, and so on and so on. So you, you really want to be able to set a reward function in real time. That's the, the main idea with respect to standard reinforcement learning. So how does that work? Um, so our main result is that this is possible in theory. So informally, there exists a representation of an environment on which you can directly read all the optimal policies for all possible reward functions in the environment. And one of the, um, this representation, which is probably not unique, but the one we got, we call the forward backward representation. So, and you can learn that representation from a reward free interactions with the, with the environment uh, offline. And at test time, you can specify reward functions in, in several ways. So for instance, you can specify a state reward list, like oh, uh, you, you have to go to this state, but you have to avoid that one because uh, the reward there is one and the reward, the reward there is minus one, for instance. Or you can specify an explicit reward function as a function of the state itself, algebraically. algebraically. Or you can also use reward samples as in uh, classical reinforcement learning. Then, when you specify your reward function, you use your forward-backward representation and the reward function to compute a policy by an explicit formula without any planning. And then you just apply the policy. So, just to give you an example of how this plays out in practice, we have a demo. So, this is on Walker, the classical environment. And here I'm going to uh, ask it to optimize the um, horizontal velocity Vx. Um, this takes like 10, 15 seconds. This is not for learning. This is just to, to generate the video, actually. And so, of course, you see that the agent is able to run. Now I'm going to change the reward function. Say I'm going to have high speed, but also I want to spin at the same time. So high speed times high angular momentum. And so it's going to do something. We're going to get a new video soon. Here it is. So now it should run and spin. And you see, I'm just giving the um, reward function as a formula and there is no additional learning. So I can play a bit more. One over Z, Z is the vertical coordinate. So this means being close to the ground. And let's see what it does. It like crouches or sits down. 
And what's fun is you can combine um, conditions. Like, let's say I, I still want one over Z, I still want to be close to the ground, but I also want to be close to X equal 10. So I'm going to put a reward like X minus X minus 10. And hopefully it's going to sit at X equal 10. Well, it's, it's very close to the ground and it's very close to x equal 10, so I'm kind of, ha of uh, happy. You can try some several more combinations like spinning but staying in place at, at x equal 10. That's actually difficult because you, you have to spin in place. Spinning while, while running is easier. So it, it first runs to x equal 10 and then trying to spin in place. And it kind of manages. OK, so you can play for yourself later. You, you have the link in the slides. Um, I'm going to explain how this works. Uh, because this is uh, well grounded in, in theory. Um, so I'm going to explain that. And I want to stress that this is work with uh, other people. So uh, with uh, Ahmed Twati and Jeremy Rapin. So we have two recent papers. And this builds on top of previous work by a lot of other people, especially work I did with uh, former PhD students and also works uh, from, from other people, starting with Diane in the 90s about successful representations and then work by Tom Schaul in particular and other people on universal value functions and universal successor features. So this is this is on top of a long line of research. So um, just the setting and notation, we have a um, Markov decision process, a standard definition, except uh, initially we don't have a reward function. So we just have a state space S, a uh, which can be discrete or continuous. Uh, I'm going to, to explain everything for the, uh, both for the discrete and continuous case, because I think that's quite important. Uh, we have um, an action space, and we have a transition function uh, given by the environment. P of dst plus 1, knowing st80, is the distribution of the state st plus 1, knowing st80. Usually, it's a measure when st is continuous. It's a measure on st plus 1. And we have the traditional discount factor gamma. And we have a fixed training set. I'm going to, to do everything offline to, for, for simplicity. We have a fixed training set of transitions that follow the, uh, the transition function p. So s, s a s prime, where s prime is the state obtained by taking action a i in, in state a s i. And rho is going to be the distribution of states in my training set. So the distribution rho is not known, but I can sample from it. And so I, I will express the algorithms as samples from the training set. So the problem is what we call zero-shot reinforcement learning. So given the train set, you have to compute what I called your mental map of the environment. So you have to compute in advance a compact object E such that if later I specify your reward function, then you can compute optimal policies in an easy way using the reward function and using your mental map. And of course, I want to maximize the amount of, amount of computation I'm doing beforehand and minimize the computation I'm, I'm, going, I'm, I'm doing afterwards. So of course, there is a kind of trivial solution, which is pre-compute all optimal policies of all possible reward functions, but this is not scalable. So this is what I, uh, why I say a compact object E, a compact mental map of the environment. So uh, I'm going to describe the outline of the method. We have an unsupervised phase. We are learning representations. So we choose a representation space which is going to be Rd in the simplest situation. So dimension D. The larger D, the, the more precise the, um, the representation is going to be. And we are going to learn two representations, a forward representation, which represents the future, 
and a backward representation which represents the past of a state. Uh, so I'm going to specify the, the learning criterion uh, later on in the, in the talk. So we learn F and B during an unsupervised phase using the uh, training set. Then someone specifies a reward function. Once the reward function is known, you compute something very simple. You compute the expectation of the reward times the backward representation. So R times B over states S and states S taken from the distribution row that is an average over the training set. So in practice for the demo, we even subsample the training set. So we have a smaller sample, fixed sample, like a few thousand states from the training set. We compute R times B on those fixed set of states. We obtain a um, vector, a representation of vac vector, because B is a vector. And we are going to use that, that vector Z uh, for the policy. So there is a particular case that is particularly interesting. Like if you want to do goal oriented, like you know that your reward is one at a given state, at a given target state. And it means that Z is just B of the target state. So that's that's a particular case, but it's it's interesting, and we have a direct formula for it. And so, for exploitation, you have a fixed policy which depends on the Z value that you just computed. And this fixed policy is you compute you use the forward representation now. You compute F of S A Z dot product with Z. So F goes from state times actions to times Z to Z. So you get a Z value, you, you take the dot product with Z. So, and you take the action that maximizes this value at the current state S, and that's your policy. Of course, if actions are discrete, you can compute this, this R max uh, directly. If the actions are continuous, you do like in SAC or that kind of stuff, you pre-train PZ to maximize this but you don't have any planning. And then you apply policy by Z. Any questions at this point? So, so I have one. Um, yeah. So about this goal-oriented setting, mm -hmm. I was just wondering, in the line above, you're waiting with row. So if the yeah. agent is like visiting row, like the target state only a, a tiny fraction of the time, would there be mm -hmm. a, a factor in front of the B of S or? Yeah. Okay. So, um, but um, scaling the reward does not have an effect on the optimal policy. Mm -hmm. So actually, for goal-oriented in a continuous state, you can assume that the reward is a Dirac mass mm -hmm. at the target state, a Dirac function. Mm -hmm. And so the expectation of the Dirac times B is B of the, of the uh, target state. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, uh, goal-oriented in continuous states mm -hmm. do, does not make sense. Mm -hmm. You have to use Dirac, uh, Dirac rewards. And what you said is you, you only need to specify the reward functions on states that you have seen during training. Is that correct? Or... Yes and no. I mean, uh, for the theory to work, you have to assume that you have good coverage by mm -hmm. the training set, of course. Mm -hmm. Like Otherwise, you rely on the neural networks generalizing. Um, so we have several extensions. Like, um, if you are working online, so a typ typical setting is you get the rewards in an online setting. And so the distribution that for, uh, so you get R of S for S distributed under a different distribution row. So say row prime, and then you have a slightly different formula. You, you have to project, uh, to project back. Uh, so you have um, a correcting term if row changes. Uh, during train and test time. Importance weighting, or is it something else? No, it's more like in successor features, like um, you project the reward function onto the span of B. Mm -hmm. So this is basically a dot product between the reward and B in L2 of rho. If you get the dot product between L2 of rho prime, you're basically computing a projection uh, using a different norm, but you you can compensate by um, when you, when you have the linear projection, 
actually the coefficients of a linear projection do not depend too much on the weighting you put on the on the basic spaces and you have to reweight by the covariance matrix of b on the one distribution times the covariance matrix of b inverse on the other distribution and that works mm -hmm. Okay. So there's one more question in, in the chat. Um, the question is, why is Z equals BS not P of S times B of S? B of S times B of S, where? Where should that be? Um, yeah, maybe the person asking the question. I think it's the same question as what you asked already, that rho should be weighting BS. Uh, yes. But yeah, like you already answered that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The it's, person it's like, is asking is P rather than rho. Rho of S, like for goal-oriented, if you have an additional rho of S, it's just a constant factor. Yeah. You don't care about it. OK. Yeah, thank you. So now, what's the intuition and what's the math? So, oh, wait. Uh, so actually, Zuran was also asking whether R depend on the actions, the rewards. Sorry, the actions? Yeah, like, can the reward function depend on the action, or are we restricted to rewards? Yes. yes, 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 yes. Yes, but then you have to let B depend on, on the actions as well. So I'm just going to simplify things and assume that the rewards do, uh, do not depend on the actions, but that's not. Uh, that's okay. just for simplicity. OK. OK. So now the idea is that F represents the future and B represents the past. The training criterion is that if it's easy to go from a state S to a state S prime in many steps, then you're going to align the future of S and the past of S prime. And of course, there are many ways in which you could do that, but we have to, to, to do that in a, in a sensible way. So we have a specific training criterion that is guaranteed to provide optimal policies if the loss is trained well. So what's the precise training criterion? So I want two equations to hold. The first equation is on the dot product between F and B. So as I said, I want the dot product between the future of S and the past of S prime to be something. And this something is the accumulated probability to reach S prime starting at S with action A and following policy pi Z. So and this probability here well, technically, it's a probability density with respect to rho. I didn't write that, but you can imagine that P is a probability density. Um, and of course, I have to specify pi z because this depends on pi z. And pi z is, as, you seen, I, as you've seen before, the argmax of f times z, dot product between f and z. So this is my target equation. So I want these two equations to hold at all times and for all states and for all z. And uh, I'm going to explain later how we train for that. At test time, it's, as I said, given a reward function, you use pi of z, and z depends on r, and zr is, is just the expectation of r times p on the row. So the theorem is that if all of this holds, like if the uh, approximations here are an equality, then all uh, the policies I, I get are optimal for all reward functions. And of course, uh, you're never going to have an exact, uh, an exact equality you're going to, always going to have approximation errors. And we have some control over the, the errors. Like uh, if, the, uh, if the equation is approximately true, then the, the policies are approximately optimal. Especially since we are going to use um, representation space with a finite dimension 
And usually, if you want an exact representation of the environment, you would need an infinite representation dimension. So ba basically, you're kind of computing optimal occupancy measures exactly. Exactly. in some abstracted way. But that's kind of the basic idea. If you're yeah. thinking about a tabular setting, then exactly. for every single state, you could com compute the optimal policy, consider the underlying uh, occupancy measure, mm -hmm. then it has some natural vector-based representation. That's the factorization into this F and a B, exactly. right? Exactly. So this okay. is going to be uh, the next slide. Oh, OK. <laughs> Sorry. So successor measure or occupancy measure, depends in, uh, depending on the community. Um, so it's exactly what you said. So imagine you start at, at S0 with action A0 and follow, and follow a given policy, where do you end up? So it's a measure of the, of the state space. And it's given by the cumulated time you spend in any given set. So it's a measure that depends on S0 and A0 and the policy. So this is an extension of successor representations. So many of you may be familiar with uh, successor representations. Um, so successor representations are defined for discrete spaces. The standard way to extend them to uh, continuous spaces is to choose a feature basis and use successor features. But here we use successor measure, which do not depend on a set of features. And then. As you said, we are, um, so sorry, just uh, going on with a successor measure. This is interesting. This object is interesting because it gives you the correspondence between reward functions and queue functions. Like the queue function is the expected reward function over states you visit. And that's exactly the integral of the reward function under the successor measure, because the successor measure is exactly the expected states you visit. So. The successor measure is an abstract operator, linear operator, that turns a reward function into the queue function for a given policy, it depends on the policy. So we are going to compute approximations of this abstract operator. The main idea is we are going to exploit linearity of part of the problem, like computing the optimal function, the optimal policy for a given reward is not linear. But when you fix the policy, it is linear. So we split the problem into two parts, like uh, we are going to compute uh, first the queue functions, even the reward functions for many policies, and then optimize the policies separately. So we are going to assume that the successor measure has a factorized representation as f times b in, in some abstract space. So if there are common features between the future of S0 and the, and the past of S, then F time, the dot product between F and B is going to be high. And hopefully, this means that the successor measure is well represented if training goes well. So intuitively, this means that you are taking a finite rank approximation of this operator uh, successor measure operator. So these features that realize that approximation are the features that best linearize the map from a reward function to a queue function for a fixed policy, for each fixed policy. So we are like exploiting the fact that part of the problem is linear and finding the best finite dimensional linearization. So now I'm ready to, to prove the theorem about forward backward. So we start with any parametric family of policies. I assume that my approximation holds. So I assume that the successor measure of pi z is f dot product b for any z. And this has to, to hold for any uh, vector value z. Then for any reward function, q is the successor measure times the reward vector. Here, uh, I'm using matrix notation, uh, assuming that the, the state is finite, but this extends to, to any state space. Um, so Q, the Q function, given the policy, is the successor measure of the policy times the reward vector. And it's F times B times the reward vector, if my approximation is correct. Then 
uh, I know that my policies by definition are given by the argmax of f times z. And so this means that for the specific choice z equal b times r, then f times z is f times b times r, which is successor measure times r, which is the q value by the computation above. So it means that pi z, which is the argmax of f times z, is also the argmax of q pi z. So pi z is the argmax of its own q function, which is exactly the uh, Bellman optimality criterion. So uh, it means that pi z is optimal for reward r. So what I've just proven is if the three red equations hold, then uh, I get all the uh, optimal policies for all reward functions in the environment. Uh, and more importantly, if all the equations hold approximately, then the conclusion still holds approximately. And the, this was in, in metrics notation for finite state uh, spaces, but this extends as operators and measures for uh, continuous states. So what's the relationship between this and successor features? Because this is actually very closely related. So in successor features, schematically using metrics notation, you start with a, a base features phi. So for imagine you have a finite state then phi is the list of feature vectors for all states in the environment. P is a matrix. And you compute the successor features psi. And psi are the accumulated expected features phi of future states. So psi is the sum of gamma t p t times the feature vector phi of the future state. So if you know about successor features, you know that this allows for an exact representation of all Q functions of all rewards that are in the linear span of phi, because Q is a uh, sum of gamma t pt times the reward. And so if the reward is phi dot some, some, some uh, vector w, then psi dot w is going to be the, the Q function. But of course, you, uh, in order to use that, you need to provide phi. So you need another criterion to provide phi. And then you compute, you compute psi given phi. So for forward or backward representations, the equation is slightly different. Instead of psi equals sum of pt times phi, we have f transpose b equals sum of pt, sum, sum of gamma t pt. So the main difference now is zero is not a solution because in, in successor features if you don't if you're not careful about phi then you have a risk of collapse like psi equal phi equal zero is a solution so you you have to have auxiliary criteria to to avoid collapse but here you have an overdetermined criterion which is f times b equal uh, um, a full rank matrix so um, so, of course, this is going to be overdetermined. And as long as the dimension of f and b is not full, or uh, you're going to have to, to increase the dimension to, to, to match the, the equality here. And so, uh, as long as you increase the dimension of the representation, it will keep creating new features to better approximate the successor measure. And in principle, you can handle any reward function just by increasing the representation of the dimension, uh, the dimension of the representation, and then the approximation is going to be become more and more precise, and so uh, eventually you 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 get an arbitrarily good precision. Um, is there a relationship between FB and successor features? The answer is yes. So you start with the FB equation. And you multiply on the right by b, b, b covariance of b inverse. And you get that ft is equal to sum of gamma t times pt times something. And what does this tell you? It tells you that at the end of fb training, 
the features FT are the successor features of BT um, covariance of B transpose inverse. Um, so there is a relationship. So in the end, you do get something that can be interpreted in terms of successor features. Except the, the learning criterion is different because we do not actually train F as the successor features of B. Actually, if you do that, it doesn't work. Like if you learn B by FB and you learn F on top of B by successor features, it doesn't work because the um, the scaling is is uh, is not right and the the dependency is not right. Like in FB, when you increase B, you decrease F, and in successor feature, when you increase phi, you increase psi, and so um, it's it's not exactly the same. Or uh, numerically, it's pretty it's pretty different as a training criterion. So in summary, uh, here uh, you have a single training loss on F and, and B. When the loss is zero, you know that the environment is solved. Uh, and the intuition is it's more or less connected to successor features using the features that best linearize the correspondence between rewards and Q functions jointly for many policies. That's the main intuition. In fact, this is for Optima policies in a way because of the argmax, right? Yes and no, because what we do, we are, we are learning too much, actually. We are learning all the successor measures of all the policies by Z. So actually, we are learning all Q functions of all policies for all rewards, not just, not just the, the rewards that correspond to PyZ. So, so we are learning. OK, so you basically overshoot. So the argmax is not going to be part of the learning criteria in a way. No, it's not. I mean, we, we have a we have a variant of FB that is lighter. Um, we, we are we are still exploring the differences, actually. Like we, okay. we have a variant, uh, we have a lightweight variant in which you don't learn. Um, you learn a little bit less. Yeah. But we are still uh, exploring that. And I think it's uh, less um, it's less resilient because um, learning all the Q functions of all the policies acts as a regularizer. Like it, it, it's similar to learning a, a world model in the end. So in practice, it seems that we learn better features if you if we do it this way. But this is a bit um, this is a, a bit uh, non rigorous at this point. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, I wonder about how things change as the set of policies changes. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the there is also a clear influence of the training set. Oh, uh, and also one big question we have is when you have a small representation dimension. Like if you take dimension D equal 50 or whatever for the representation space, um, it's clear that you have to make choices. And you could make choices in which you learn a very precise representation either in a very small part of the, of the space, or you could learn a less precise representation, but for a wider set of reward functions. And we don't mm -hmm. understand how that works yet. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so you, you mean have, like, yeah. You you could have several fixed points of FB. Like mm -hmm. if you fix the policies pi z, so like you fix pi instead of letting pi be argmax of f, you fix pi and you train FB, then we have a pretty good understanding on what kind of thing is going to happen. And we we understand the fixed points and the fixed points corresponds to eigenvectors of the successor measure and so on and so on. But now there is kind of a circular correspondence between F, B, and pi. And I believe, like my feeling is that there are several possible fixed points of FB training, of FB and pi training. Mm -hmm. So like you could learn, um, you, you could learn um, policies that are good for navigating Paris very well, but nowhere else. Or you could learn policies that are less good at navigating Paris, but better at navigating the world uh, as a whole. And 
I mm -hmm. cannot, I don't have any uh, theorems on that. I think there is a lot that comes uh, in, in, the, in the priors, uh, the inductive yeah. biases and so on. Okay, so we have a bunch of questions uh, in the chat. Uh, so Bo is asking, Bodai, uh, wondering about the connection with uh, between this FB representation and SVD of uh, P, or maybe SVD of success of measure. Yes, there is a link. Um, it's not the, well, it, it depends on the training criterion. So, P. Here we are training by TD. So if you minimize, like, if you just go back to the definition of FB, FB, F times B equals sum of gamma T, P, T, and you minimize that loss as a matrix, then of course the optimal FB is going to be the SVD of the successor measure on the right. Um, this is optimal for the L2 error. Um, here we are going to learn F and B via TD, which is, and, and you know that TD does not optimize the L2 error between the Q function and the estimated Q function. So we are going to actually compute something else, but we have a theorem. And the theorem is if you learn FB by TD, you don't get the SVD of the successor measure. You get the left or right, I don't remember, eigenvectors of the successor measure, which is slightly different. It, it's the same if P is symmetric, but usually P is not symmetric. Mm -hmm. And so you get something related. And of course, what I would like is to relate this to uh, performance because the L2 error on the Q function is not the best error measure for performance mm -hmm. because we are more interested usually in the advantage function. Like we are interested in the ranking of actions, not in the Q values. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is um this is a whole different discussion. Um, but yes, we we have some some partial understanding of that. Uh, of that. Okay, Chan Chan was asking whether the factorization of F be related to linear MDP assumption. Not uh, not really. Um, so linear MDP would be a low rank assumption on P. This yeah. is usually a very bad assumption. Like, if you have a continuous time system, in small time, P is very close to the identity because the state does not change much. And so P as an op operator on functions is close to the identity. So it's never small rank. Like, P is never small rank. The successor measure, sum of gamma T, P, T, well, it's more well behaved, like the, the spectrum is more widespread. Why is that? For large T, usually in an ergodic environment, PT becomes rank one or small rank because you have a, a stationary distribution of states given the policy. Yeah. So for large T, PT is going to be rank one. And so the sum gamma T times PT, depending on the, on the value of gamma, uh, for very large gamma, it's going to be almost rank one. For slightly smaller gamma, it's going to have um, more wide spe uh, wide, uh, widespread spectrum, but still a small rank approximation or low finite rank approximation kind of makes sense. So mm. actually, it's very different from a mm. uh, low rank MDP assumption. Mm. Okay. Uh, then uh, Nitrar was asking whether uh, there's some way of trying to learn a covering of the space of measures being used by the policies? Uh, we could do that by a diversity criterion. We didn't try. Or uh, we could add a penalization term. So since we are learning the successor measures, we could ask that the uh, expectation over Z of the successor measure of pi z covers the whole state well. So this would be an auxiliary loss, staying, uh, saying that expectation over z of fz times b must be um, close, to, um, close to one or close to one over one minus gamma actually, so that mm. we, we cover on the space uniformly. Yes, we could do that, but we didn't in the mm. experiments. 
Um, I have several options for the rest of the talk. I prepared options for the rest of the slides, so maybe I can give you an overview. And yes. you can choose on, on which part you want to ask questions for the, for the discussion, maybe. OK. So um, there is the experimental side. So we tested this on tasks from the unsupervised reinforcement learning benchmark. So it's not, it's a benchmark that existed before we did this. So here you have like four tasks in Walker, four tasks, four tasks in Cheetah, four tasks in um in a quadruped, and we also have like tasks in a, in a discrete maze that actually turns out pretty different in the in the ranking in the in the conclusions in some of the conclusions. So here we compare forward backward to um, a supervised top line. Supervised means you have access to the reward at train time. And so you train a, a policy specifically for the for a specific reward. And here on this task, forward backward reach uh, about uh, eighty five percent of the of the performance of a reward specific method. So which is not bad. And of course, we compared with successor features using plenty ways of building the basic features for successor features like using an autoencoder and then successor features on top of autoencoded features, using Laplacian eigenfunctions, using a uh, low rank transition matrix, low rank uh, transition uh, approximation of the transition matrix, which corresponds to a low rank MDP assumption, as you said before. So actually it's a little bit, bit better than random features, but not that much. The best successor feature based approach was using Laplacian eigenfunctions. And forward representation uh, comes on top. It's about 80 something. Uh, and Laplace and Eigen functions have 70 something. So it's not that bad either. And actually, Laplace and Eigen functions and forward back rep representations are the only ones that performed uniformly well in all the tasks and environments. Like all the other methods have several failure cases, but the, the pink one and the, and the red one are pretty stable. So here I have some slides on how we train F and B via Bellman. So it's a measure valued Bellman equation. And there are, uh, so the math uh, is, is pretty neat actually. In, in particular, you have a norm of the error that completely avoids having a sparse reward problem. Uh, because uh, usually uh, well, when people learn uh, matrix valued uh, successor representations, they use a sparse reward like uh, one when the current goal is equal, uh, current state is equal to the goal. Here we avoid that because you can compute the, the contribution from that algebraically. And this is pretty important actually. Like this really efficiently uh, mutualizes information from uh, how to reach different states in a, in a, in an efficient way. So here, for instance, you have um, in blue you have the classical goal condition in which you have a sparse reward. In purple you have HER, and in uh, other colors are FB for different re uh, representation dimensions. And you see that it's really more simple, efficient to do it that way. And I think that's pretty important. And this trick, this is um, this is a trick that applies to other methods, actually, not just FB. It's a it's a trick like it's a computation that people have been doing wrong in the literature, and it makes a difference. So that's one thing. Um, you can compare FB to classical model based. As I said, there is a um, relationship. So we don't synthesize states as prime in the future. We just have an energy model which is f of s should be aligned to b of s prime if s prime lies in the future of s. But this is not a generative model, so there are no imaginary trajectories. Instead, we learn an occupancy model for many behaviors. But the big difference is in model-based, you learn a transition function of the environment. It doesn't depend on the policy. Here, we learn long-term transition functions. But that depends on the policy. And so we have to, to do that for many policies. So to some extent, we gain because it's not a generative model, but we lose because we have to learn future occupation measures for many policies. 
Um, of course, you would expect that you would need a large representation dimension. The experiments use d equal 100. So it's not a large language model by any margin. Uh, but still, like uh, in Mudra code, d equal 100 is enough. So eventually, of course, uh, you would like to do this with much larger uh, representation uh, dimension. So I would like to tell you that I know that the features we have are optimal for something at downstream uh, time. Unfortunately, I don't have that. I have a very partial result that characterizes the optimal features for two sets of, goal uh, of downstream tasks, maybe goal reaching, namely goal reaching or random Gaussian rewards under some pretty strong assumptions, which is a uh, large entropy polarization. So which means we stay close to a reference policy. But this is an algebraic theorem, which is not directly related to FB. It's more related to successor features, which gives you a full characterization of the optimal successor features. And they are related to the um, eigenvectors of the inverse Laplace operator symmetrize. So there has been a discussion in, in the literature about successor features, like successor features are good because eigenfunctions are good and whatever and, and whatever. I've never seen any theorem that actually links this to downstream performance. Here you have one, but it has a lot of assumptions. Uh, and the conclusion is not uh, Laplace and eigenfunctions. It's something that reads a lot of, like the same, but is still technically different. Uh, so we can talk a little bit more about that if you want. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are lots of uh, possible extensions. So right now, we have a representation that makes planning unnecessary. Um, we can easily incorporate priors. So a usual prior is that you must observe the, the whole universe to make predictions. But you know in advance that the set the reward function is going to depend on a very small set of variables, like yourself and your family. To have accurate predictions of the future, you still have to observe everything. But the reward function is usually restricted. And so this can be done in FB very easily. But by letting F uh, depend on the whole environment, like even the history of observations, if you are not in a, if you are in a partially observable setting, but letting B only depend on the part of the state that is useful for the reward. And then the theory is the same. So you have a much, much larger F and a much smaller B. And this means that instead of approximating a square matrix or uh, infinite dimensional operator, which is the successor matrix, you approximate a rectangle, rectangular matrix, which has one large dimension and one small dimension. And of course, a small rank approximation makes a lot of sense in that case. Um, we have some limitations because of the, approxim of the FB approximation. So we have local blurring. So we have good representation of large scale behavior. But if you want to reach a very specific uh, state within uh, 0 0.1%, then you're going to have some, some uh, mismatch due to, to the approximation error. That's, I think, unavoidable without fine tuning. And of course, we would like to test more environments. This is being done and scaling up to, to much larger environments and representation dimensions. We are working about the finite rank model, because this is based on the finite rank approximation. And there are many ways around that. One of the, uh, of the ways is the kernelized version. Uh, another one is the hierarchical version. Uh, and the hierarchical version, I like it a, lot, it a lot because here the correspondence between tasks and vector z is linear, but you can turn that into nonlinear uh, very easily. And the theory is the same, and we are doing some preliminary experiments right now. But the theory um, goes, uh, goes pretty well because you, you just for the kernelized version, for instance, you just have to assume that the dot product between f and b lives in a, 
in an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. And then the, the theory is the same and the algorithm, the training algorithm is the same. We don't deal with exploration. So, so far I've been assuming that we have a train set with good space coverage. So this is something uh, that's missing. Um, we deal with a single environment. And of course, currently we are like in the demo you've seen, you have to type a formula to specify your reward function. Of course, it would be not much nicer to have a natural language task description or a user demonstration. So right now we are working on user demonstrations and seems to be going pretty well. Natural language is uh, if someone from large language models can spare a bit of time for people in reinforcement learning, they can help us. Um, and of course, uh, someday maybe uh, real robots, but that's a full different story. Thank you. All right, thank you. Very inspiring. All right, plenty of questions. Uh, so at one point you said that uh, there is an opportunity to fork, and I was very curious about the algorithms and uh, this TD learning, and then what comes of that. Like understanding a little bit more of that would be, I think, nice. Maybe before diving into further things. Okay, so the question is, how do we train F and B by TD, right? Well, in a way, the fixed point equations were pretty clear as as you were showing them. Yeah, that's that's okay. Uh, after that, there were some some things that were going on, and I couldn't. I didn't have a chance to catch okay. those. Yeah, um, yeah, it it was not intended to. It, it was just intended to show that this exists. So it was pretty good. The, the fixed point equation. I'm going to deal with a discrete space because things are a bit simpler to to for just for notation. Yeah. So the fixed point equation is successor measure equal identity plus gamma times p times successor measure. Sure. And you just plug in the model successor measure equals f times b. So now you have a fixed point equation for f times b. So you can do td. You can define the loss between uh, which is the difference between the left hand side and the right hand side. You can plug in a parametric model for f and b, keeping f bar and b bar from the right hand side fixed, as in Q-learning. And this loss is in the finite uh, state case, it's just the norm of a matrix, FB minus identity minus gamma FB, gamma PFB. So you can expand the Frobenius norm. It's the FB times FB minus two times FB times identity uh, minus two times FB times gamma PFB plus a constant. Mm -hmm. And so you can just take the gradient of the loss with, re with respect to the parameters of, of f and b, and that's it. Sure. You so, were saying something about that this avoids some yeah, reverse part of the yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because usually, here we have the identity term, and the identity is just a way of saying that the current state is the goal state, like s equal s prime okay. in the matrix. Uh, People used to sample that instead mm. of using that it's the identity. Like people so in a way, making this explicit is, is is the way this is avoided, right? So yeah, it's just yeah, like... yeah, yeah. Okay. So unless you're doing HEO or something, but uh, quite often people have a reward like one when I'm close enough to the goal, and then most of the time I don't have the reward because I'm not close enough to the goal. So they sample a state, they sample a goal, and so on and so on. But actually, you can compute the expectation algebraically using this. And it works in the discrete case, but it also works in the continuous case. The continuous case, because you we use the, the measure valued equation, so we have a Dirac measure, but integrating uh, with respect to a Dirac measure is, is very easy, actually. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so in the discrete case, 
like the identity here in the loss gives you when you expand the Frobenius norm, it, it just gives you minus two times F times B. And in effect, that means that you have that in the loss. So each time you visit a state, you align, you minimize F times B. So that means that you, uh, you minimize the loss, so you maximize F times B, sorry. So you align F of S and B of, and B of S. And that is equivalent to sampling a state and a goal and waiting until the state is equal to the goal, except it's much more sample efficient. And this is not specific to F and B. This is like we have a paper with a former PhD student just doing that for goal-oriented Q learning. Like if you learn a goal-oriented Q function, Q of S, A, and a goal. Mm -hmm. And people used to do that with uh, like uh, hand-designed um, hand reward functions like Sure. Uh, allowing for some approximation between the state and the goal, but you can compute the expectation uh, algebraically. And this is much more efficient. Yeah. So the, the, the reference is here, and mm -hmm. it makes a difference. And it's... Oh, so uh, the, in this experiment, uh, can you describe the experiment a little bit more? What is the success rate? Okay. So this is, um, so the environment is, is Pac-Man that you have here. Okay. And the task is goal reaching. Okay. What is the goal? A uh, goal is a target state. Okay. So you but it's just like a location for Pac-Man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so here you have, if Wait, blue, there are no ghosts and whatnot? Um, there are ghosts. Yes, there is a ghost here, the, the ghosts are moving around. So yes, the ghosts are interested. OK, and is it batch learning still? It's like you have a fixed data set? Uh, for this particular experiment, I don't remember. Maybe, Ahmed, you remember? No, it was uh, it was online, so it was. It was online. So this one, uh, this one was online, OK. And so in blue, you have a uh, goal condition Q learning. So you learn a Q function that depends on S state action and a goal in the, in the naive way. So you get a reward when the state is equal to the goal, which is almost never. Well, the state isn't that big, so you, you get some rewards, but it's very inefficient. In purple, you have HER, which works well. I mean, it, it's doing its job. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, trajectory relabeling. And the other curves are just the FB loss. So using the algebraic uh, contribution from the identity term. Right, right. And uh, what are the policies here? Uh, the policies are the FB policies. Argmax? So argmax of F times Z. That's, uh, yeah, it's that one. Okay. Okay. Because earlier we were talking about that that's sometimes problematic, but it seems that in this case it's not. Uh, sometimes problematic, like in uh, in discrete spaces, you can just compute the argmax exactly. Okay. In continuous action spaces. Also, yeah. when you meant problematic, you just meant that it's computationally, there are, even the argmax can be difficult. No, we pre-compute we pre-compute policies by Z. In that case, like we use something like DDPG actually to 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 take the the gradient of F times Z with respect to the action A, and we do that at train time. So. Uh, okay. Gotcha. So in uh, in SB you have two equations: the equation of F on mm -hmm. f times b and the equation of pi. Right. If right, actions right. are finite, you can just define pi that way. Mm -hmm. If actions are continuous, you can just train pi to approximate the argmax sure. at, time, at train time. Mm -hmm. And this is typically what you do. Yes, like in the demo, this is what what we do. 
Okay. So you're actually using the argmax um, as much as you can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have some, I think, a little bit of Gaussian noise on the action, and this helps with optimization because DDPG without noise is not reliable enough. But yeah, that's right. basically what we do. Okay. All right. So we have a bunch of questions in the chat. Uh, Francesco was asking a bunch of questions. Francesco, do you want to ask your questions? Okay, sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, the first question was you stop when you have your loss equal to zero. So that's an empirical loss because you have your finite data. No, um, no, no, the loss is never equal to zero. Exactly. That's, that's what I was pointing at. So when do you stop and how does it work? Early stopping. I mean, we, okay. we have some quantities that we monitor during training. So we have, um, we have the Bellman gap, uh, the Bellman gap, the empirical Bellman gap on F times B. And so we can monitor that, for instance. And, and if it's if it goes down and it starts going up, then it's time to stop. Okay. So and it seemed to me like you're building this successor features as eigenfunction of this finite dimensional operator, which is a Koopman Bellman operator. And mm -hmm. so how do you choose your base features, the one you called phi? No, we don't we do not use phi. I mean we oh, use okay. F and B, but F and B is not related to Psi and uh, to Psi and Phi. Um, so this is an alternative to using Psi and Phi. Classical method is is Psi and Phi. New method is F okay. and B. So the classical equation is Psi equals sum of PT times yeah, Phi. Exactly. New method is F. F times B equals sum of gamma T, P, T. And here you don't have to choose anything. You build F and B at the same time. You don't have to use phi and psi. OK, that's why then you could like end up in fixed point that you were talking about. Yeah. Because they can like eat each other. OK, OK. But yeah. way, so, so here it's important to point out that this P matrix lives in the state space in a way. If you don't have access to the states, then you have to do something about that. What do you mean? What I mean is that, like, how is P defined? It's like states everywhere, right? Yes. Let's say it's discrete. Mm -hmm. And if you have, I don't know, observations, then it's like, okay, you know, you have to do something about this. Everything is expressed. So, um when training so I, I said here on a finite state you have a forbanis norm but on continuous states actually um you use uh you use the distribution row over the train set and you have additional row factors in the in the forbanis norm so actually you use a slightly different norm which is an l2 of row forbanis norm and it turns out that the loss is expressed as an expectation over rho. OK. And as such, it's not that important that you actually have access to the state. But no, you just sample integrating over them. Yeah, it's an expectation from states right. over rho. And so you just sample states in the data set, and you do SGD. So yeah, it's, okay. uh, it's an expectation over the data set. Yeah. Of course, if you have a very bad restricted data set, then it's not going to work. And here, sorry, uh, part of the confusion is because I've been simplifying the equations. Because normally, um, the target equation for FB is um, successor measure equal FB times rho. So I, as I was saying earlier, F and B is actually not a probability. It's a probability density with respect to rho. 
Right, but right. Here, to simplify the equation, I've been omitting the row factors. Yeah, you were dropping the row. Yeah. Um, I'm still, OK, uh, confused about this. So if you have a data set, and in the data set you didn't record states, you recorded transitions but with some observations, and there is some very bad state aliasing, how would the method be impacted by that? Here, we assume full observability. But do you really need that? No. Somehow you don't need it, but something is needed, but I don't exactly know what is needed. So, say you... Um, say you're in a partially observable setting. Sure. So in the simplest situation, I would know in advance that the reward is going to depend on part of the state that I can observe. Because typically the reward depends on me and I can observe myself. Okay. Uh, then you would need F to have instead of the current state to have the whole history of states so you would have f of st minus 1 st minus 2 st minus 3 and so on and so on so f would be a recurrent network and b would be unchanged like conceptually f must depend I on see, every, I see, everything I see. you you have to use to make accurate predictions of the future and B must depend on everything you have to know for the rewards you're interested in, which is usually much smaller. If you don't have any prior at all mm -hmm. and the reward can depend on the whole history of the universe, then both F and B has to have to be recurrent networks. But then I, I think in that case, it's just too ambitious. No, I. I... I think that leaving with that B just depends on things that your reward depends on is is a perfectly valid and reasonable choice. And yeah, like uh, yeah, I I understand now. Yeah, like what where where no anything was baked in is that F is really a function of the state, but okay. If you don't have the state, then you have to use history. And yeah. that's, that's the only place where you need to use that. Yes. OK, got it. So yeah, I've written everything for the um, MDP case, but sure, it sure. extends to the POMDP case. Mm -hmm. OK, Francesco, back to you. Uh, OK, um, I had another question about uh, the comparison you had. And you said the Laplacian eigenfunction uh, mm -hmm. performed best. Uh, yep. So that should be true if the horizon is large enough. So what is the horizon, time horizon you're considering? Oh, we had gamma equal. It's a standard value. So Ahmed, do you remember the exact value of gamma? OK, OK, but yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, around 0 0.98 or 0 0.99. Okay, okay, okay. And I had one last question. Uh, are are you learning an like um, an ergodic partition of the system by doing this? Because um... you're just you just have the action on f so that it, sh it seems you're learning an invariant partition of the system and yes to okay, some control approximately yes because so the fb equation um so for each policy uh you would expect pt to converge to something rank one but depending on the policy yes and B is common between different policies. Exactly. So you would not exactly, it's not a partition, but it's like B represents the factors of variation of the stationary distributions for different policies. 
Okay. Something like that, intuitively. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Okay. So that's not a problem in what in your experience with this no. method? No. Okay, okay. Thanks. Oh, these were all my questions. Thanks. <laughs> I think we have one more question from Pawan. Do you want to speak up? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. OK. So uh, I'm. since you mentioned that you're going to learn all possible uh, uh, policies at each state, so that sort of uh, leads me to believe that all possible or uh, the best policies that can be learned is uh, available there. Uh, so the question is, uh, looking into the training data, uh, can we tell that if this method is not performing uh, well enough, that means it has to do something with the training data that contains incomplete information, or is the learning lacking something? Uh, it's a very good question, but I don't know. Um, it it if you have a bad performance, it uh, it could mean many things. It could mean that the representation dimension for F and B is too small. It could mean that it's a deep learning trick that didn't go well. Um, we seem to have pretty stable training right now. Um, so yeah, of course, it, it, it could also mean that the behavior you are uh, asking for is is not represented at all in the training data, and then, of course, you can hope for some neural network magic to to generalize to 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 some new behavior. But this is only this is only a hope. Thank you. Uh, a related thought is uh, mm -hmm. when we try to identify dynamical systems uh, using an input output data uh, collection system, mm -hmm. if you use sinusoidal input and uh, try to get out the dynamics. It's a hard challenge, and most likely you're not going to hit it. But if you use a white noise as an input, it's going to excite all modes of the system, and uh, the identification results are much better. So that way, when you look, if the method is good on a certain good data set, uh, I'm trying to understand that uh, the, usually the problem is, do we have good enough data set or not? And that's quite a hard question to answer. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> I don't think I have an answer for that. Um, of course, the uh, ultimately we we want to have a good exploration method to go with uh, FB. Like depending on the policies you're building, you realize that you must explore more in some directions. But like my personal belief is, for this you have to use priors. Because in real life, you can learn to play the piano really well, or you can learn to explore the galaxy really well. And there is no, there is no criterion that is going to tell you that one is better than the other. So in FB, if you have dimension 100, basically it means that you are going to learn a subset of behaviors. Which subset of behavior is better than any other subset of behaviors? In general, I don't know. Yeah, I think it's controlled by the, the by the training set largely. Like all the approximation errors. Like imagine you do everything perfectly using the FB loss and so on and so on. Uh, this norm is actually going to depend. Instead of a forbidden norm, it's going to be actually um, a norm in L2 of rho, where rho is the training data distribution. And so depending on the training set, you're going to optimize the loss, uh, putting different weights on different parts of the space, and that's going to control the set of skills that you're going to learn. So the training set is a kind of prior. Thank you. And then, way, and this, yeah, sorry. sorry. Oh, just a more, small question: This here, the F bar should be also indexed by Z. 
F bar? Uh, yeah, F bar depends on Z. On Z. Yeah, sure. Okay. Sure. Sorry. I will update that. But you were saying? Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course, if you want to increase the training set in real time, even for that, you, you are going to need priors because you, you could decide to explore, like, to explore atoms or to explore the galaxy. And these are two completely different directions to, uh, of exploration. And my personal belief is uh, exploration needs a prior. Ooh. OK. Um, different question. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned a little bit some hierarchical approach. So some you're working hierarchical, on? yeah. Yeah. Uh, OK. So here, the problem, well, one of the limitations of FB that I don't like right now is that the task representation is linear in the reward function, because the vector z is expectation of r times some, some b. So it's linear in, in r. So this means, basically, that we have a fixed set of features. We compute the dot product between the rewards and the features, as in successor features, actually. And then this is your task representation. So and this corresponds to using a low rank model of long term probabilities uh, given by the features that you have. What I'd like to have is a hierarchical model that say you have a set of features and you compute the reward, the dot product between the reward and a set of basic course features. And one feature, so you could extract some very coarse information like is the reward about food or is the reward about books, say, for instance. And then given the course level information on the reward function, you could have a, a more specific set of features like once you know that the reward is about books and not about uh, food, you could have a specific set of sub features, which is, for instance, what's the title of the book, what's the author, and so on and so on. So you can you can do that by your hierarchical encoding. So you compute a course level representation of the task, representation of the reward function, because Z is a representation of the reward function. And of course, the main limitation in zero-shot reinforcement learning is how do you represent the task? Because the set of tasks is infinite dimensional, so you have to reduce that to a finite dimensional vector somehow. And here we do this by projecting a dot product with B. So if you want to do that hierarchically, you have a set of course features B1, you compute Z1, and now you have a set of refined features that are allowed to depend on the course features that you computed. So B2 depends on Z1. And then you can compute a Z2. And it turns out you don't even have to change the theory. Because then this is an FB representation that has a joint B equal the pair B1, B2, except now B2 depends on Z1. So it's like FB, except now B can depend on Z partially. But now you're Tax representation can be fully nonlinear because B2 can depend nonlinearly on Z1. And actually, when you iterate, like you have Z3, Z, Z4, and so on and so on, you can have um, there's a universal approximation theorem which tells you you can represent any nonlinear function of the reward function. So, this is a more expressive model. And now you can have. Um, you, you can have more task specific behavior and um, like it, I would expect like we are doing some very preliminary experiments on this. And I would expect, for instance, to have much more um, spatial precision. Like imagine you have a, an environment with several rooms. And if you have to use a very coarse FB representation, then you're going to go to the right room, but not to the right position inside the room, maybe or Maybe you're going to have some spatial precision that you that you incur, and here I would expect to uh, the precision to be much better with this. Uh -huh. So I understand that like adding one layer allows you to introduce nonlinearity already, and that was your call. But yeah. 
wouldn't make more sense to go for multiple layers in this hierarchy. Um, like you could have another one that's based on Z2 and then somehow the B2 and B3 and whatnot, they would be limited in terms of like how nonlinear they are, but all together the whole map would be, you know, a much richer set. Yes, yes. I don't know. Well, uh, I, I don't know either because to some extent, you, you can have several layers inside B2, or you can have one layer inside B2 and several layers of Z2, Z3, Z4, and, and so on and so on. So it's like a neural network of neural networks, yeah. a deep neural network of deep neural networks, if you want. But this is related to um, set invariant functions because uh, permutation invariant functions. So imagine you have a set of samples, state reward, S-I-R-I. -I. The reward representation is not is going to be invariant by permuting the pairs, uh, the the pairs in your in your data set. Like you you have a data set of state rewards, and you want to compute a representation of the reward function based on that. It does not depend on the ordering of the of the set of um, state reward pairs. So there are some universal approximation theorems which tell you that if you want to compute arbitrary permutation invariant functions of a set, you have to use this um, iterated hierarchical stuff, basically. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'm ex already expecting a gain from just using two levels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All right, uh, maybe one last question and then we should go. Uh, Paul Antoine, uh, do you want to ask her a question? Uh, yes, uh, it might be off the track, but uh, I was wondering if you compared uh, the successor measure uh, learning uh, with the, the C learning approach? Yes. I saw it in the Leonard Villiers thesis. Yes, yes, yes. Because uh, actually, I, I've been implementing the, the both. And uh, I, yes, exactly. So there is a relationship. And this is a text that um, that's. You, you can find to some extent in Indian uh, thesis as well. So um, C learning, well, there are some problems with uh, C learning. Actually, uh, Leona was not able to reproduce the, the results in the in that paper. So okay. um, <laughs> that's a bad sign usually. But so C learning is a contrastive method. To uh, It's another way to learn the successor measure using a contrastive method. It has some shortcomings, like you need to have some on policy data. Uh, and then they have an argument which is not, which is a, a bit uh, fuzzy mm -hmm. uh, in my mind. Because uh, they propose also enough policy. Yeah, 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 yeah. they propose enough policy, but it, it's like, okay, let's plug in this approximation. Um, yes, that's the, the reflection I had. Uh, so we can reinterpret um, their algorithm as a weighted loss. Uh, and they have a quite a complicated weight. So here in this notation, M theta is a parametric model for the success of measures. So mm -hmm. small m here is equivalent to big S M in my, in my talk, in my slides, mm -hmm. right? And so here you have the um, the loss on, on small m, and here you can decide to introduce weights in the loss, weights that depend on the pair of states that you're considering, s and s prime, s or s and s2. And of course, you can decide on any set of weights. It's still going to be to be some loss function. Mm -hmm. And C learning is equivalent to a very complicated set of weights that is given by a formula. 
So it's not pretty, but there is a correspondence. Yes, I saw it, but uh, my question was, uh, I saw uh, that uh, Leonard Bier did a comparison uh, between uh, the, the approaches. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you went further uh, on the comparison. No. Okay. No. Um... I'm not sure that C learning can provide planning free uh, policies at test time for any real world function. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Okay. Yeah, thank you again.